currently being translated into English, and I'm helping to edit the work on this project, so I can, I can uh, recommend those books. They're quite um, heavy-going, kind of academic approach to basic teachings, but rock-solid, absolutely, um, the best thing around, I would say. Yeah, there's just so many books these days, it's hard for me to, um, to, to really discriminate in that way. It's more through, through reading the suttas and through them, um, just getting a sense of um, you know, what, what teachings really illuminate the basic principles, if you understand them. And, uh, like reading is basically in two things, I think. One is inspiration and the other is information. Um, so some books may be very kind of um, not much information there. Not, if you've read a lot of books already, unlikely um, if you even come across books after a while, it's just, wow, I've never heard that before. It's more going over ground that you've seen covered before. Um, but that sometimes it can just be very inspiring through the, the way that it's presented or the person presents it. Um, in terms of the, to say, the information, then I, I found throughout my monastic career the works of this, um, this senior time work is by far the most helpful and um, best things that I've read. My understanding of Buddhism is, uh, owes a great deal to, to this particular monk. I got a question about uh, um, fostering, developing the capacity skills of really managing emotions in children yeah. as part of the education provided in schools. Could you give us a, a few examples, practical examples, how teachers can help? in that process of in the classroom as part of the lessons that uh, children improve the skill of managing emotions. Yeah, well, I, um, obviously I, I'm not here on a regular basis, but uh, fortunately this morning I, um, I was um, talking uh, with Neil and Michelle, and Michelle gave a good example um, of a child who gets angry, and when he gets uh, very angry, can, uh, can be um, hit other children, for instance, or be violent or aggressive to other children, and then teaching the child, uh, you know, I recognize your anger, so you're not saying someone's bad because they get angry or, or making them feel small or bad. They're saying recognize your anger, but at the same time, cannot condone you expressing it in this way. You need to find a better way of expressing that kind of negative emotion. So th this is um, very much, uh, I would say, in line with the Buddhist principle where you're recognizing negative emotion as such um, and not um, denying it or, or castigating someone for having a negative emotion and not making them feel bad on account of that. But saying that you need, uh, but you don't have to um, express that in that way, um, and you need to uh, develop more skillful kind of ways of, of dealing with that kind of stress and tension, whether it's going up and kicking a ball around or, or doing some yoga exercise or, or, or whatever that might be, would depend on the particular child and the kind of situation. So I think that. Um, in encouraging children to be more aware of what's going on in their body um, and how do you feel right now and, and what's this feeling and in cases for, um, and bringing up um, particular emotions for discussion for instance they have a discussion about sadness you know who's, 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 whoever feels sad what, what, how do you feel when like you're sad what do you feel is in your body what kind of thing, what do you think when you feel sad? And just have children talk about it and, and, and discuss ways of, of dealing with it. So I think that um, taking the nature of negative and positive emotions and, and, and bringing them up for discussion or when they arise in the course of the education process, not saying this is something that's um, a problem 
that's preventing the education from, from proceeding, but saying, look, this is something that we really need to look into, um, and trying to develop that interest in, in learning about emotions and how to deal with them, and particularly to give the children the sense that they don't have to be completely ruled and, and um, uh, carried away by their emotions, that there is a middle way between expression and repression. So that in, uh, with mindfulness, there is a, a suppression of external, uh, certain kinds of external expression, and then a willingness to bear with and to look at and to learn from what's going on. So that, that's, um, obviously that's an ideal and it's not very um, easy to do and um, I think that uh, even for the teachers to be doing that themselves in their own life is probably quite a challenge already but at least that's the, you know, the, that's the way that um, Mark and Dick, myself and the people who are involved in the school you know, really want the school to go in this direction and to be encouraging those skills in the teachers and to be developing over the next years the ability to, to transmit that kind of um, education and to, uh, and to instill it within the children so that they have those kind of skills they can use when they leave the school. Um, talk about uh, with this thinking process of Yoniso Manasikan, yeah. he advocates as a very important part of education. A lot of us here are involved in education. And uh, I myself often wonder, what is the best way to apply that in the classroom? Can you say something about it? Yeah, well, um, Yoniso Manasikan is a technical term um, in, the, in the Pali literature, which is um, most commonly translated as wise reflection or wise consideration. And there are two, two main kinds of this wise reflection or Yoniso Manisikara. Um, one um, are um, ways of reflecting on experience um, in order to um, reduce the power of certain negative emotions or to stimulate and to nurture positive emotions. That's one area. Um, the other area is developing the ability to reflect on the nature of experience itself. So to give, to give you an example, um, in the case of uh, someone who, let's say, um, angry, so in the case I said just now, someone's feeling very angry, and so that's all right, you know, so it's not bad to be angry, but don't hit anybody, don't shout at somebody, and they sort of look at the nature of anger, be mindful of it, learn from it. But at the same time, as a, as a larger context, if someone still has the idea that I have a right to be angry, or um, I only feel really alive when I'm angry, or you, know, you have some kind of theory and belief uh, underpinning a negative emotion, then you have to use the wisdom faculty, the reflection, to unpick that, or to question it, to challenge it. And um, one kind of wise reflection then would just bringing up examples from the past when you've acted or spoken in an angry way and caused lasting problems in relationships with other people when um, you you realize that when you're angry you often say and do things that are, are much stronger than you intended as you say um, when you're angry and you indulge in that anger then you're releasing all kinds of poisons into your blood system so you have all these kinds of points of reference and recollection that you can think about um, which um, which seek, which seek to um, help to reduce the anger. At the same time, if you are developing wise reflection, Yoni Sarmanisikara, about um, 
the value, the beauty, the nobility of kindness and forgiveness. So this is like an opposing. So a lot of times you you are doing basically replacement theory, um, and the idea is that at one moment, if your mind is wholesome, it cannot be unwholesome. It's unwholesome, it can't be wholesome. So if you have an unwholesome mental state, anger, if you can reflect in a way that can create a wholesome mental state which directly opposes it, you can replace it. Um, so if you are, um, you can bring to mind, for instance, not necessarily only thinking, it's mental activity. So visualization would be part of this also. Let's say you have, um, uh, you can think of a teacher or someone who you have seen in a situation where under a great deal of pressure and you think that if it was me, you know, uh, I would have lost my temper and yet how could he or how could she just be so calm and so at peace and so kind and so that's a memory that you can bring to mind and reflect upon um, as, a, as a model so you're modeling non-angry behavior using that mem power of memory and recollection of particular stories and um, or if someone a friend that's not necessarily a teacher someone else who's model kind and forgiving behavior that we can bring to mind. So it's using the power of the mind to think, to reflect, to visualize, um, to, um, to deal with mental, uh, negative mental states. So that's one kind of Yoni Sarmanisikara. The other kind of Yoni Sarmanisikara is reflection on the way things are, particularly the impermanence of things, the unsatisfactoriness of things, the selfless nature, and it's chapter Karmanita. So, um, like my teacher Ajahn Chah was saying, you know, it's my nair, it's my nair. So you're, you're constantly reminding yourself of the instability, the uncertainty, the um, unreliability of phenomena. So my teacher say, like when you when you really like something, you say it's my nair, it's not sure. When you don't like something, it's not sure. So in your mind there's this constant kind of recollection that you can't take this so seriously, that this isn't going to give you true lasting happiness or it's not the end of the world. So when somebody gets depressed, really depressed, they, their assumption is it's always going to be like this. Or if it changes, it's just going to get worse. You know? um, and But losing that sense of the fluidity and the, um, the, the transient nature of nature of phenomena. So, um, so the cop had actually by him to sound great. Jahe, talk to him. 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 Talk to อ่าคุณสมรจําคุณสมรธรรมอยู่ในจิตใจเช่นอ่าจิตใจโกรธแค้นเป็นต้นก็ปิดคิดพิจารณาในทางที่จะสงเสริมคุณธรรมอ่า